O Sacrament Most Holy, O Sacrament Divine, all praise and all thanksgiving be every moment thine. Most Sacred Heart of Jesus, Immaculate Heart of Mary. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The title of my sermon, were it to be preached after Sunday next, would be wrong, because it would not be Blessed Cardinal John Henry Newman, it would be Saint John Henry Newman, the first English saint since the Reformation in the 16th century, not a martyr. All our other saints since the end of Catholic times in England under Henry VIII have all been martyrs, professed their faith, priests, laymen, laywomen. This saint will be different. And when we expose the Blessed Sacrament earlier, what was the hymn that we sung? Praise to the holiest in the height. The words, not the music, by Cardinal Newman from his famous oratorio, The Dream of Gerontius. Now, those who have heard me uh, preach on the day with Mary before know that I always try and say something about the church and the parish where we happen to be. And there is a link with Cardinal Newman, soon to be saint, and this parish. You might not know it, but I'm going to tell you. The priest who founded this parish, and in the shrine to Our Lady, the beautiful Vietnamese lady statue, because, as you know, this Church of the Holy Name and Our Lady of the Sacred Heart in Bo Common is, as well as being a parish, is the Vietnamese chaplaincy, and thank God for the Vietnamese people and their great Catholic faith. I lived with a Vietnamese priest in St. Anthony's Forest Gate for four years, Father Anthony. Ko Dung, I think is how you pronounce his surname. And what a wonderful witness he gave to us all. But the Vietnamese chaplaincy is a modern expression of Catholic life here. The priest who founded the parish, his name is, was, is Father Gordon Thompson. And in fact, in the Lady Chapel, there is a memorial plaque to him. You can read it. He was a member of the Church of England, and he became a Catholic under the influence, in the second half of the 19th century, of Cardinal Newman, and that whole movement known as the Oxford Movement, which brought so many people in this country who had been members of the Church of England into the Catholic Church. Now, Father Thompson was a married man before, obviously, he was a priest. He became a Catholic, but his wife died. And that left him with two small children, two boys. So he arranged for his sons to be looked after by other members of the family. And of course, they went to school, boarding school, in fact. And he, Gordon Thompson, what did he do? He went to a seminary and was trained as a priest. Now, today in the Catholic Church, we have quite a number of married priests, former Anglicans, the Ordinariate and others. But in the 19th century, someone who was a member of the Church of England, whether they were a vicar or not, but married, couldn't become a priest. But Father Thompson, as he became, his wife had died, he was a widower, so he could, and he did. But he was a man with private money, he was fairly wealthy, not rich, but not badly off. 
So he went to the cardinal, the Archbishop of Westminster, the great Cardinal Manning, the father of the East End of London, the one who settled the dock strike in the 1880s. And he said to the Cardinal, Your Eminence, send me, Father Thompson, newly ordained, to the poorest part of the Westminster Diocese where there is no church. And the Cardinal said, Go to Bow Common. So he did. He came in the 1880s, and within 10 years he'd built this beautiful church. And he changed his name, or added a name. He added the name of Mary, Our Lady. So he was Father Gordon Mary Thompson. One of his sons, Wilfred Thompson, became a priest. So father and son And they are buried together in the same grave. If any of you have ever been to St. Patrick's Cemetery in Leytonstone, just over the border in my diocese, the Diocese of Brentwood, they're buried father and son, two priests. Father Wilfred Thompson, he became a canon Thompson of the Brentwood Diocese. He was very badly injured in the First World War, in fact. His face was half blown off, if you look at a photograph of him, by shellfire. And he had a very sad death. He was run over on Christmas Eve in Chelmsford, where he was the parish priest. He'd just been hearing, just had supper on Christmas Eve. He was from in a, with a parishioner's house. He was crossing the road back to his church to hear confessions before the midnight mass. And he was hit by a lorry and died. Cardinal Newman... John Henry Newman was an influence in Father Thompson Sr.'s life and therefore in his son. So I mention that by way of introduction to this church, this parish, which as I said now is the Vietnamese Catholic chaplaincy. Now, Cardinal Newman, as you know, was a very distinguished member of the Church of England, a theologian, a preacher, an academic at Oxford, and he was received into the Catholic Church on the 9th of October, 1845, at a place called Littlemore, a village just outside Oxford, where he had been the Anglican vicar, as well as being the vicar of the university church in the centre of Oxford itself. And he was received on the 9th of October, into the church by blessed Dominic Barbary, a wonderful Italian priest, a member of the Passionist Order. Our blessed lady, Cardinal Newman, as an Anglican and as a Catholic, spoke, wrote, and preached a great deal about her. But you won't find one single book, as it were, by Cardinal Newman containing everything that he said or taught about our Blessed Lady. You have to do an awful lot of reading in his sermons, his lectures, and bring it all together. One of the great influences in Newman's life, really the thing that led him to become a Catholic, was his study of the history and the theology of the early church, the church fathers. And he looked at the early church, and then he looked at the Church of England, of which he was a member until 1845. And by the way, he was a Londoner, born not far from here, near Liverpool Street Station. That's where he was born. He was a Londoner. So he's a London saint, thank God. As well as being Oxford and then Birmingham, of course, the founder of the Birmingham Oratory. But we in London can perhaps say he's ours first, in a nice way. Newman looked at the history and the theology of the early church. Then he looked at the Church of England, then he looked at the Catholic Church, and he came to the conclusion 
that the early church, the Church of the Fathers, St. Athanasius, St. Basil, St. John Chrysostom, St. Augustine, was the same church, is the same church as the Holy Catholic Church under the Bishop of Rome, the Pope. But when he left the Church of England to become a Catholic, he was criticized, he was shunned. He always saw the continuity between his Anglican past and his Catholic present and future. He was always very, what we would now call, ecumenical, a great respect for what the Church of England had given him and taught him. He didn't just throw it all away and say it was no good. But he realized that it was not enough. Nine years after he became a Catholic, so in the year 1854, Pope Pius IX defined the dogma of the Immaculate Conception of Our Lady. And when he did so, Newman, who by that time, of course, was a Catholic priest and had founded the oratory in Birmingham and was also going dashing across the Irish Sea dozens and dozens of times to establish the Catholic University in Dublin. Newman saw the definition of the Immaculate Conception as confirming, if you like, his own theory, his own theology of development, that the Catholic faith, the truths of the faith, remain the same, but our understanding and appreciation of them develops, it deepens. That's perhaps his greatest contribution to theology in general, but also to Mariology, that branch of theology that deals with our Blessed Lady. I'm going to quote you now just a short passage from one of his books called Meditations and Devotions. He says this, about the Immaculate Conception. First, she, Our Lady, was preached as the Virgin of Virgins, then as the Mother of God, then as glorious in her assumption, then as advocate of sinners, then as Immaculate in her conception. And this last, the Immaculate Conception, has been the special preaching of the present century, the 19th century, the century in which he lived. And thus, that which was earliest in her own history is the latest in the church's recognition of her. So the church doesn't invent, it can't invent doctrines. But it understands those truths of the faith more fully, more completely, as her, the church's history, develops. Now, Newman was not very popular in the Church of England among many because as an Anglican, he did preach about Our Lady. And at that time, because he was trying to see or to try and make the Anglican Church more Catholic in a sense, he wasn't popular. And he was criticized he was criticized while he was an Anglican, and he was certainly criticized when he was a Catholic. But throughout his life, Anglican and Catholic, Newman pondered, he prayed, particularly about our Blessed Lady. She is not merely the mother of our Lord's body, he says, when it was a sermon that he preached on the glories of Mary but she is to be considered the mother of the Word himself, the Word incarnate, God, in the person of the Word, the second person of the all-glorious Trinity, humbled himself to become her son. He took the substance of his human flesh from her and clothed it. In it, he lay within her. He bore it about with him after birth as a sort of badge and witness that he, though God, was hers. He was nursed and tended by her. 
He was suckled by her. He lay in her arms as time went on. He ministered to her and obeyed her. He lived with her for 30 years in one house with an uninterrupted intercourse, with only the saintly Joseph to share it with him. She was witness of his growth, of his joys, of his sorrows, of his prayers. She was blessed with his smile and with the touch of his hand, with the whisper of his affection, with the expression of his thoughts and feelings for that length of time. Now, my dear brethren, Newman concludes, what ought she to be? What is it becoming that she should be who was so favored? Newman is a master of English prose. He read his sermons. He didn't preach them sort of from the top of his head. He spent hours preparing them, and he read them. The Victorians generally did. Nowadays, a lot of priests preach without notes or perhaps with only one or two uh, things written down. Newman never did. And that's why, thank God, we have literally millions and millions and millions of his words in books, in letters, in writings, in sermons. It's probably one of the reasons it's taken so long to canonize him. They've had to read everything. I'm going to end, because I've only just given you a very small glimpse into blessed soon to be Saint John Henry Newman's teaching and preaching about Our Lady. And by the way, in a few days' time, on, on Wednesday, the 9th of October, we will f celebrate the Feast of Blessed John Henry Newman for the last time. Sunday, he becomes a saint, and next October, the 9th, the day of his reception as a Catholic, it will be Saint John Henry Newman. But I'm going to conclude with another quotation from the sermons called Dix Discourses to Mixed Congregations, which Newman preached in his early Catholic years in the 1840s, late 1840s and, and 1850s. And he addresses Our Lady in these terms. Such art thou, Holy Mother, in the creed and in the worship of the Church, the defense of many truths, the grace and smiling light of every devotion. In thee, O Mary, is fulfilled as we can bear it, an original purpose of the Most High. He once had meant to come on earth in heavenly glory, but we sinned. And then he could not safely visit us except with a shrouded radiance and a bedimmed majesty, for he was God. So he came himself in weakness, not in power, and he sent thee, a creature in his stead, with a creature's comeliness and lustrous suited to our state. And now thy very face and form, dear mother, speak to us of the eternal. Not like earthly beauty, dangerous to look upon, but like the morning star, which is thy emblem, bright and musical, breathing purity, telling of heaven, and infusing peace. O harbinger of day, O hope of the pilgrim, lead us still as thou hast led in the dark night across the bleak wilderness. Guide us to our Lord Jesus Christ. Guide us home. Blessed soon-to-be saint John Henry Newman, pray for us. And you know, one of the greatest privileges in my life as a priest, three days after I was ordained, I said Mass, so it's 27 years ago, but I did the same, in fact, two years ago for my Silver Jubilee, 25 years. I celebrated Mass in the room in Littlemore where Dominic Barbary, Blessed Dominic, received John Henry Newman. And at the end of the Mass, I was given the Rosary. October, we're in the month of the Rosary. If I'd had more time, I could have told you more about Blessed John Henry Newman and the Rosary, because he spoke a lot about the Rosary. But I was given Newman's Rosary to say the Rosary, to, to say that prayer. And I sat there in the chapel on my own, 
saying, saying the rosary, the rosary which Newman himself had used as an Anglican and then as a Catholic. And you could see how the beads have been worn in his fingers. That privilege is given to every priest, as far as I know, who celebrates Mass in Newman's Chapel at Little Moor. Little then, he wasn't even blessed when I was ordained as a priest. Little then did we, or did I think, perhaps any of us thought, how soon he would be a saint, because it seems that it was never going to happen. It is now, praise be to God. O sacrament most holy, O sacrament divine, all praise and all thanksgiving be every moment thine. Most sacred heart of Jesus, immaculate heart of Mary, blessed John Henry Newman,